continue with the uh, introduction. So, um, Mr. Ulbricht is going to explain that to us, but I just wanted to give a short overview. So, the new AI Act has been proposed, has been um, published as a proposal in, in April. Um, it addresses the risks of AI systems and it may potentially position the EU as, as an entity setting a global standard on the regulation of AI. Um, it is following a risk-based approach, so Mr. Olbrich will explain more in detail what that may mean. And then depending on the risk, you know, the providers have to ensure different um, levels of trustworthiness of their system. It's currently a proposal, so it will still be discussed in the Parliament and the Council, which may mean that it, um, it may still change and also that it will still take some time for it to enter into force. But it's important, of course, if you're in this industry to know what will be coming and to see what it will mean for SMEs. So really the questions for us today is how can we make sure that this is fit for SMEs? And also, of course, just to share information and to hear what this is actually about. Um, as you know, Digital SME, we are the largest network of ICT SMEs in Europe. So we represent altogether more than 20,000 digital SMEs across Europe. Uh, we have the national regional members, and then in our working groups, we also associate um, SMEs directly, so SMEs can join the working groups. Um, but this, this is the overview of our four members, and um, we're set up in a way that we have the uh, sort of umbrella structure, digital SME in Brussels, uh, then we associate national, supranational, local associations, and then the companies are associated with the um, associations at the national and regional level. We represent digital enablers, so as we as we call them, um, front runners in the ICT sector, developers of software, um, of AI solutions, uh, IT security providers, so different activities in the ICT sector by SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises. And, and what we have as a, as a vision with our group is really to build a digital single market, but also to identify um, synergies among the SMEs and bring concerns towards policymakers at the EU level. And also, as you know, here part of the focus group on AI, this is also the ambition we have for the focus group, that we want to form a network of AI innovators in Europe and that we can develop joint activities, but also bring feedback to the European Commission on um, topics relevant to AI SMEs. Euro as a group, we're now close to 140 to 150 SMEs in the group. So different SMEs providing AI solutions from across Europe in different sectors and also having different maturity levels of AI. Um, so some really developing new algorithms, others really more doing perhaps consultancy service, services. So um, a variety of, of SMEs. And um, what we've done so far with the group last year, we responded to the proposal or to the white paper on AI. We have done a couple of workshops last year this year, we focused on the Data Governance Act, for instance, on we organized a workshop on AI and standards. Now we have the workshop on um, the AI Act. And in June, we're going to have one on advanced manufacturing. And we're also going to launch new smaller groups where we want to focus on specific um, items such as AI and standards and AI and ethics. So to work more on these topics and smaller groups together. Um, yeah, as you know, you're available, your profiles are available on our website. Um, just to remind everyone that you can you can also look up the others in this um, on this page. And um, as as working groups, as what we do with digital SME working groups is really that we want to enhance and support this exchange with policymakers, but also as SMEs give you visibility at the EU level. Um, give you a framework for joint campaigns, but also inform you about funding, developing positions, and also um, it develops mm -hmm. guides on specific standards and make sure that standards also work for SMEs. Uh, yeah, and with this, I would like to hand over to Mr. Ulbricht for the actual um, 
presentation of the AI Act. And um, I look very much forward to the discussion. Mr. Ulbrich, I'm going to make your presenter and hand over to you. One second. Great. Good, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I know that artificial intelligence is a, is a very, uh, it's a topic which everybody's talking about. Uh, and I know also that uh, there are lots of things to say about this, which is why we have taken so many pages to, to write about them. Uh, I had a, in a previous meeting, I briefly pointed out that, of course, uh, if you take the entire package on AI, which we published on the 21st of April, uh, we're running in the hundreds of pages. I think the uh, AI Act, so the uh, AI regulation, is 107 pages. We ha also have the coordinated plan, which is another 60 pages. And of course, we've got the impact assessment, which is including annex is about 200 pages. So there's a lot of uh, things to read, which of course is one of the reasons why not everybody will be able to read all of this. Uh, unless you actually are, are working on this full time, it's it's impossible to follow uh, all, all, the, all the all the details, which is why we're happy to, to give uh, give presentations as, as, as much as it's possible. Um, the um, the first thing I, I always like to say, and it's not actually in the in in the regulation, but it's very important, is that um, there was the package on AI, and the package on AI consists of two parts. Uh, as I just said, you have the regulation on the one hand, and you have the uh, coordinated plan on AI on the other hand, which is a very bureaucratic title for a kind of action program of the European Commission and the member states in order to support AI development. Uh, and that's not an accident. Uh, from the beginning, we have done AI policy in the European Union since about 2018. We had a first communication in 2018, and we had a coordinated plan. We had uh, a high-level group which created some ethical guidelines in, in early 2019, uh, and we had the white paper last year. And every time, uh, we have very strongly insisted on the fact that um, AI is something which we think is very good but that we have to address some of the concerns which may, may arise. So this kind of double-pronged approach that, yes, on the one hand, we want to promote it, but on the other hand, we have to also you know, be concerned that there may be some things going wrong. Uh, that's something which, which, is, uh, which is, be, has been running through the commission policy and which is very, very important. Uh, I, don't, I know that the AI regulation, of course, because it is, applies to everybody, is, is, is getting much more attention. And the coordinated plan has lots of very interesting things, but which are more of, of, of real concern to people who are, are very much involved, so that it doesn't get as much public attention. But it's really very important. And we know, you know that we have a commissioner, Thierry Breton, who comes from the, from the digital uh, company, from, from, who has been working for a long time in digital companies. And he's very, very much insistent on the fact that we don't want to make AI sound bad. Um, so yes, we do have this regulation, but this is by no means an indication that we are in any way concerned uh, that AI might be a bad thing. Um, and that, of course, is something which depends uh, a lot on who you're talking to. I mean, if I'm talking to SME companies in digital area, to people like you, you obviously are convinced, or may, most of you will be convinced that AI is actually something, something very good, something uh, where we have lots of, uh, <coughs> lots of, uh, which has a lot of potential and we can, which can bring lots of benefits. But if you talk to some other people, then there's a lot, there are a lot of fears and concerns. You know, they have watched too many uh, science fiction movies, or they have some concrete concerns about the data protection or various other things. So um, we're trying to really find the find the balance here between. On the one hand, reassuring, uh, reassuring people that it's not dangerous, and on the other hand, um, promoting AI as much as possible, uh, which is really what I call here the baseline. So AI is good; it's for good for consumers, it's good for business. So consumers, you know, obviously they can profit from new products, businesses, they have new business opportunities, and for the public interest, it's good in terms of things like improved healthcare, less traffic death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, it creates some risks. Um, on the one hand, for the safety of consumers and users, of course, in AI applications, if you put them into machines, um, they, uh, you know, the machines can go wrong and they might be dangerous, actually physically dangerous. Uh, best uh, example of actually both cases on the, on the one hand, on the other hand, are self-driving cars. Uh, AI uh, helps to produce self-driving cars. That's going to reduce the number of traffic fatalities. But on the other hand, there will still be some people die dying even with it, with, uh, with AI-driven cars. So then people will be concerned about the fact that some people have been killed because of AI malfunctioning. So they will be, and we have to address that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the issue of fundamental rights. You know, there have been uh, lots, of, uh, lots of debates about AI where 
uh, on, on, on the one hand, the general image of AI that you get from uh, from from the movies, especially that you that you have a situation in which humans become powerless, uh, in which decisions are taken which you don't really understand, you don't really know uh, why you have been affected in a particular way uh, that you have been affected. And then on the other hand, you have, especially among civil society organizations, a very large concern about possible discriminations uh, by AI. Uh, generally accepted to be uh, not uh, intentional, um, but uh, more uh, 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 an effect of various imperfections in, in AI. And then, if you get these two together, of course, then that that may uh, that raises some concerns, uh, and that's especially important because some people, you know, because there's already a very a large skept uh, skepticism uh, in the general population, and that for that's something we have to address. Now, uh, why do we have a specific regulation in AI? Uh, so given that, uh, what I just said, so there are certain concerns, um, keep in mind that we already have legislation in, uh, in, in the EU, which applies also to AI. So it's not like we're starting from zero. Uh, AI is uh, subject to general data protection regulation, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and, ma and many of the AI products are subject to specific uh, products as in physical products are subject to the specific legislations which uh, apply to certain sectors. Um, but uh, the, as I just said, you have certain features which can make it a bit more uh, dangerous or, uh, or can generate high risks. Uh, keep in mind in this context that high risk in this particular area, in this particular relation has a different meaning to what you understand as high risk if you talk to normal people in the street. You know, for normal people in the street, high risk means uh, it's something which can kill you or which you know can can cut your arm off or is something which is going to have a devastating impact on you. Um, high risk here means uh, things which are which have a high risk of infringing on your fundamental rights. So it's not the same concept. Um, that's the that's one thing. The other thing uh, is personally I. I'm not very happy about this terminology. We, have, we, have, we, have, we are using it. We have been using it uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, it was it was originally um, used by the high-level group. Uh, but high risk uh, always implies this kind of idea of, are you, are you sure you really want to do this? So if you're saying something like, this is really risky, um, or this is high risk, um, that kind of implies, well, think about it. Are you really sure you want to do this? And that is, of course, not at all uh, our intention. As I, I said, we don't want to discourage AI in general, and we don't want to discourage high-risk AI either. So it's not that we're saying, okay, AI in general is okay, but the high-risk, well, you know, really think about whether you want to do it. Uh, we all, what we're trying to do here is that to set certain standards that you have to uh, that you have to follow when you're developing AI high-risk systems. So it's not that we are. This wanting to discourage even the development of, uh, of high-risk AI system. I think that's very important. So um, we are um, the um, as I said, we've been doing this for with the policy on AI has been running for three years. Uh, last year, you will have noticed that we have the public consultation. Uh, Digital SME, I think, uh, also coordinated some responses to that. Um, it was very, a very, um, a very large participation in the public consultation. We had more than 1,200 uh, responses, uh, and it also was a very widespread uh, participation, which is, is is quite interesting. Very often, you only get uh, responses from the businesses and and the special NGOs which are affected. And in this case, we really had uh, a lot of, of spread. We had plenty of citizens. We had plenty of businesses, industry, of course. We had plenty of civil society, a large share of academics. Had a good uh, a good share of, of public authorities, so it, uh, there was clearly a, a lot of interest and a lot of input from all across the sector, and I think that's very good for public consultation. And if you look at the map, um, you obviously uh, we also had a very large uh, ge uh, geographical spread, obviously within the EU, but also we got plenty of comments from from other countries, including from countries which are not the usual suspect. Of course, you know you would expect the US and UK to have plenty of uh, actors that would be interested in that, but also we got. Uh, responses from 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 countries like Iraq, Syria, Mexico. So uh, it, there's clearly a, a very, very widespread uh, interest to that. Um, before I forget it, last year we had this white paper and that was a public consultation. The public consultation we did 
gave us these 1,200 answers, which were then used to produce our proposal. Um, the proposal has been adopted by the Commission. So, uh, from our point of view, we are not going to change the proposal anymore. There is uh, a feedback procedure in the Commission, which means that for eight weeks, or actually in this case has been extended to 12 weeks, after the publication of a proposal, we still collect feedback, but that feedback is something we summarize and send to the Parliament and to the Council. So we ourselves don't do anything with this feedback anymore because uh, we are not, you know, the, the, the proposal is now out of our hands. It's now the Parliament and the Council who will work on this. So by all means, please feel free uh, to submit feedback, uh, but keep in mind that this is only something we then transmit to the Parliament and Council. So in case you're interested in, in, in talking to people or, um, you know, if you want to transmit your position directly to, to Parliament and Council, you can, of course, also do that. Um, that might, in, in specific cases, uh, even be more, more efficient. Uh, but I'm not trying to discourage you from participating in the feedback. I'm just trying to, to, to explain to you what this actually means. So after this very long introduction into the context, let's go to the... Um, to the uh, regulation itself. So the first big issue, of course, was the defin definition of artificial intelligence. Um, we've tried to, um, we've built up, we're building uh, on, on the definition of the OECD. So the, the, the left part, which is the thing you find in the main text of the, uh, of the um, regulation is mostly from the OECD. We have slightly, uh, slightly modified it in order to uh, insert generate output uh, because not, it doesn't always uh, make uh, decisions or recommendations, but basically you have a, a AI is a, is a software which you, you give it some objectives and it then it kind of takes some decisions or suggests decisions or makes content which leads to certain things. Um, so it's a fairly, that's a fairly open uh, decision, which is important because we don't want to specify any particular technology because A, we've uh, a general principle of being technology neutral and B, we also uh, want to be uh, future proof. Um, you know, there's a number of technologies on the market today. Uh, some of them weren't on the market two or three years ago, and there will be others in, in the future. And uh, legislating today for what's on the market today uh, and in such a way that in 2025, uh, you can't use the text anymore, that would not be very helpful. So we have to be, uh, we have to have a definition which is wide enough to be able to, to apply in, in, the next, uh, in the next decade or so at least. Uh, and on the other hand, we also wanted not to make it too wide. So that's why in Annex 1, we have added a list of various technologies um, which you have to read in combination. So it's, you have to, uh, the, the way to do it is you have to, uh, it has the, you know, to, for something to be considered AI, it has to be considered uh, to, for, for first of all, the, the definition, which is now on the screen on the left side. And then in addition to that, it has to use, to use one of the techniques and list it in, in Annex 1. So that's, so Annex 1 is kind of a, a way of reducing the scope so that it doesn't become too broad. Um, the next uh, big issue, is, of course, is the one of uh, what is it, you know, what does, does the regulation apply to? Um, and here uh, we have the, this famous, uh, you probably heard, heard about that, this famous risk-based approach. Um, so we are, uh, we have a grading of basically four levels. One is, and that's really very, very small, it's unacceptable risk, which are, um, well, I'll come to the next one, on the next slide, which are completely forbidden. Then you've got high risk, uh, as I said earlier, so things which are uh, high risk in the sense of they, there's a higher, it's a fairly high risk of uh, infringing certain of your fund my fundamental rights <coughs> or of course your security. Then you've got uh, plenty of applications <coughs> um, which have uh, only minimal requirements and then you have a very large share of minimal of no risk so applications which are not concerned at all. Uh, and we've, we've done that in a pyramid because the idea is really that the unacceptable risk is, is very, very small. High risk is, is still small somewhere between small and very small. And then most of the applications have either no, uh, uh, are, are we either considered to have no risk at all or to have a very, very limited risk, which is, has only a, an extremely, extremely minimal uh, consequence. So let's start with the ones which are completely forbidden. Uh, there are really only th three cases plus uh, 
face recognition or remote biometric identification. First of is subliminal manipulation, um, which is um, you know which is a technique um, which is uh, well used to manipulate people and therefore it's forbidden. Um, secondly, uh, it's um, exploitation of a vulnerable group groups. So if you if you're making children or mentally disabled, uh, mentally or other otherwise disabled persons addictive. Uh, with various uh, manipulative uh, 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 methods, or if you are introduce them to dangerous behavior, that is also forbidden. You have the general purpose social scoring. That's what we know from China, uh, where you get, um, you know, where you get uh, uh, a, num a number of points, and then every time you cross a, a red light, you get one less. And if you don't have enough points anymore, then you, you can't take the train anymore. That, of course, is as well forbidden. And then for a remote biometric identification, um, i.e. face recognition today, we always call it uh, remote biometric identification because of course face recognition is today, but there are other things you can do as well. You can do, well, or you will be able to do at least at large scale, you can do it today. Gate recognition, you can do voice recognition and other things in order to identify people. Um, uh, and that is uh, extremely limited. It's not completely forbidden. Uh, so it's forbidden with exceptions, but um, it's extremely limited because it has a very strong impact on obviously on your privacy. Um, so what are the high risk? Uh, in, so if th those are the, basically the three plus uh, face recognition, the, the four cases which are, which are really forbidden. Uh, and then we have a list of, um, of high risk cases. Uh, the first part of that is, uh, are the safety components of regulated products. So if you have a product which needs to be approved for safety, um, um, then, the uh, AI system in there is considered uh, high risk as well. So in other words, if you have a car, which is a dangerous uh, machine because it can kill you, and then you put AI in there uh, in such a way that it affects the safety of that car, then that AI is considered uh, high risk, uh, which means that um, you basically have to, to add the AI requirements to, to the other requirements which you're doing on that product anyway. Um, and all of these products have conformity assessment ex ante, all of these basically are products which have to be certified in, uh, before, and AI uh, will just be integrated into, into the existing or into the updated uh, conformity assessment procedures. And then you have this, the standalone AI systems in the following fields. Uh, so you've got the biometric uh, identification, we've got the critical infrastructure, management of critical infrastructure, so you know, um, energy nets, uh, networks, uh, uh, car networks, I mean, uh, transport networks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, education and vocational training, uh, employment and working management, uh, enjoyment of, of certain private uh, essential services, and, that, and then we've got the entire uh, public authority domain, law enforcement, migration, and justice and democratic processes. Um, and actually in the, so these are the, the titles in the, in the public, in the, uh, in the annex to the, um, to the legislation, there's, there's a concrete, that's actually the actual list of things uh, within these areas. So it's not like everything in, in employment is concerned, but there's, there's actually a list in there. Um, and that's it. So these are the only cases which are considered high risk. If you're not on that list, you can forget about the rest. I mean, you can forget about all the requirements for high risk. And, and that was a very important element when we when we were drafting it to say we have to make sure that as many people as possible can look at the, can, can look at the regulation and say okay that's fine not for us we can do our we can you know follow our life uh, as it was before so if you're not on the list you're not high risk and therefore you don't have to follow all the all the all the procedures uh, yeah well the the, the procedure the conformity assessment um, procedure so you first of all you have to Check, step one is to check on the list whether you're classified as high risk. Uh, then you have to basically follow the requirements. You have a conformity assessment procedure, uh, which exists for all the products already with the safety components. And you will have to do one, uh, a third party as well for biometric identification. Everything else or the other self-standing is self-assessment. It's not, it doesn't need to be certified by a third party. Um, the requirements um, for uh, high risk are uh, basically the five sets of requirements which you know from the white paper. So in the white paper, we already we, we suggested a set of requirements, uh, and uh, with a couple of wording changes, this is pretty much what's 
uh, what's still in the legislation. So these are the five areas where you have to uh, where you have to look at. Um, which gets me to my next important point. Um, most of what we are what 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 is is written here is self-evident or is standard anyway. Um, for example, you have to ensure if you're product producing it, you have to ensure the robustness and accuracy and cybersecurity of your product. Now, I'm, if you're developing an AI system, that's what you have to do anyway. Uh, if it's not accurate, nobody's going to buy it. If it's not robust, people will very fine, soon find out it's not gonna, that, that and they want it. And cybersecurity, of course, is something that people pay attention, uh, pay a lot of attention to as well. Um, and therefore, to me at least, it looks like much of the debate of what is high risk or is not high risk is really a symbolic debate. Because let's say, for example, um, you produce you know, something for AI for law enforcement. Uh, then you have the debate, well, is this really high risk or not? But if you tell them, okay, what, what do we actually have to do? And well, you have to make it accurate, you have to have high quality trading. And the people will say, yes, of course, we want that. You know, if you have a system for, um, you know, for law enforcement, where which which helps you with one, I don't know, with something, or, or for asylum and migration, um, and you, you you talk to people and, and they and people say, well, are you sure this is really high risk? Um, and then you discuss that for half an hour, and then so what do you actually have to do? Well, you have to make sure that your data are valid. Of course, they, you know, of course, they, they want to have a system which actually performs, which is accurate and robust, because that's what they need. So much of the uh, and obviously and the same goes for 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 the other things over human oversight so much of the requirements we're doing is standard anyway we think it's important that they are laid down in legislation because there's always some operators which do not follow follow the the, the standard procedures and therefore uh, it's important that it is mandatory even for them but for most operators the the the, um, the, the additional requirements are really nothing nothing special, which is why the entire debate of am I high risk or am I not high risk is, at least at this stage, very symbolic. I realize that, of course, some people might be concerned that if they're cl classified as high risk now, there will, in the future, be additional requirements. Um, but at, at this stage, you know, and you never know what happens in 10 years, I really can't tell you. Um, but uh, at this stage, at least, uh, I think it's very much a, it's a, a symbolic uh, debate rather than anything else. Uh, yes. Okay. We we did have the uh, the obligations. Um, yeah. Um, I th I think that's pretty much what's spelled out in the in the um, in the legislation. Um, so just to remind you of what you, uh, what you have to do. Um, first of all, you have to uh, develop the system. Then you have to check whether you have to do a uh, conformity assessment. You have to register it in a database. That's the one thing you actually have to do. Um, and yeah, you have to do, uh, you, you, you declare yourself the conformity unless you are face recognition for standalone systems. So because most of them are, except for face recognition, they're all um, self-assessment. Um, by, by the way, I, don't, I, th I thought there was a slide coming for the, um, Oh yeah, that's still coming. Okay, and then we've got the um, uh, remote biometric identification. You may have followed the debate. Of course, that's the hot potato everybody has been discussing about. Um, it's important uh, to distinguish this. I mean, what we're talking about here is really the kind of mass scale face recognition system where you identify people out of a crowd. So we're not talking about using, say, face recognition to, to unlock your phone or even to um, to um, to any kind of uh, access system where you basically have a picture of you or more general uh, biometric information of you and you do a one-to-one -one checking is so I have this say face here and the person coming in here does uh, does it have the same face yes and no if yes then you go on if no then you can't get in that's not what's what's concerned here what you what is concerned here is uh, the, are the kind of systems where you have a camera on a, on a public space uh, and then you um, basically scan everybody who's, who's walking by to see whether there's somebody you're looking for. Uh, and then that is, is, is uh, strongly restricted. Uh, it's not completely restricted because there's some, uh, some situation in which it may be necessary, but because it has a very strong impact on, on privacy, it's, it's very severely restrict, restricted. So these are the high-risk systems. Um, and most systems, as I said, will not be high-risk. 
uh, in the impact assessment, we have uh, estimated the size of the high risk systems from somewhere between five, somewhere between five to fifteen percent of all, of all AI systems. Um, and we've done that, you know, to be on the safe side because in the impact assessment, you also have to, you know, um, let's say guess the highest impact it could possibly have. Probably it's going to be, you know, five percent and even less than that. Um, so uh, for the not high risk, so you've got the, the no risk whatsoever, um, where you have no obligations. And then you have very minimal notifications for some other systems. So if you have a chatbot, for example, um, it has to say somewhere on the screen that it's a chatbot. So, uh, you know, really only to let people know that they're not talking to a human. And that, of course, only applies if A, it, it sounds like, I mean, it makes it sound like a human, and B, if it's not obvious from the context. So if you're talking to your car, you don't need to put that out because it's clearly from the, it's clear from the contracts that you're not talking to a human. Um, Defakes should be labeled. Um, that's important um, because defakes are, are getting incredibly good. And then, of course, for public opinion uh, and, and for the political debate and, and all kinds of other things, you, you can do a lot of damage. So um, defakes need to be labeled. Uh, and you have to tell people um, if you're using emotional recognition uh, or biometric categorization. So emotional recognition, um, for example, are things, and that, you know, that's the people are. People are concerned about emotional recognition systems, uh, but there are plenty of different systems. I mean, one of the very useful emotional recognition systems, for example, are the kind of fatigue detections in cars. So that you have a system uh, which detects uh, a fatigue in your car, uh, a fatigue in the driver, and therefore slows down the car so that you don't crash or, or wakes you up. So that can actually be very useful. Uh, so these are the only minimal requirements that you have, and then for everybody, everybody else doesn't have any requirements requirements whatsoever. However, you can uh, you can uh, adopt codes of conduct if you're interested. And here uh, I'm coming more or less to the end. Uh, supporting innovation, we also have in the regulation um, two, uh, well actually three articles on supporting innovation. One is on regulatory sandboxes where you can get access to um, advice from public authorities um, uh, on how to interpret existing legislation when you're developing your, your AI system. Uh, and uh, we also have the, have uh, through the Digital Europe, um, the, the, the European Digital Innovation Hubs uh, and uh, the t um, test and ex uh, experimentation facilities, we also have uh, at least two systems which can help you in developing your AI and especially in putting it onto the market. Um, the governance structure, if you're interested, is uh, fairly simple. Uh, most of the supervision will be done uh, in each member state. We have a, uh, a kind of committee on the European level, which we call the Artificial Intelligence Board, where the member states come together. Uh, the European Commission is the secretariat, so we prepare the papers. And there will be an expert group um, of, of experts in the field to advise this, this group of European regulators, which are coming from, national, uh, from the national authorities. Um, it's not in the regulation, actually, the expert group, because we, I mean, expert groups actually don't have to be uh, in, in regulation because we can create an expert group any given time, so there's no need, therefore, to, specif to specify that in, in, the, um, in the regulation. But uh, the plan is to create an expert group, which will then, uh, so expert group, expert from industry and from, from civil society, which then advises the, uh, the European group. And with that, I end my presentation. I'm afraid I've been a bit too long, but uh, I hope it wasn't too long and I hope you're still awake. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ulbrich. I think as, as far as I'm concerned, I'm still awake and it was, uh, it was indeed very comprehensive, but also um, really interesting and really good. And um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure because you were speaking, it wasn't possible for you to also look at the chat because we had a couple of questions also coming in through the chat. So people were interested about the, the global impact, uh, about what it may mean, um, where the, there was a question on social scoring, which, which was already answered. Um, then a few more specific questions on on, yeah, for instance, if, if nudging with consent would be permitted or um, how, how it will be defined in terms of software versus manufactured product. In any case, I think the, the best would be, um, there are also a couple of questions on the harmonized uh, standards 
and how this would be linked. Um, but I guess the best would be to, to just give people the floor directly so they could ask their question. Um, I'm gonna maybe start just in the order of the chat here. And then if people have additional questions, you can also just put your name here in the chat. You don't have to formulate your question completely. Um, and then we can continue like that. And I can see that um, Professor Bryson is the first, and then we have some, we have Leonard and then Emilia. So maybe we can go in that order. And if I missed anyone, um, please feel free to to make me aware of that. So let's start with, Ms. with Professor Bryson. If she is still here. Okay, no, I don't see her anymore. Okay, let's maybe then go to um, to Leonard. Ah, yes. Leon? yes. Yeah, Leonard, let's go over to you. Yeah, so my question concerns, uh, I mean, the limit of the subject matter to AI. And uh, here I guess from the, uh, this, I guess, appendix we've published uh, lately that AI is any kind of statistical model or anything of model that's trained, but also the more extended, uh, like symbolic AI. Uh, but why limited to AI-based systems? Since we can create like a biometric system, for example, based on um, completely non-statistical algorithms and it has just the same risks as uh, an AI-based system. Well, I think the... Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think as far as you know that you could, for example, do face recognition without AI. Can you do that? Can you... Could you, you know, find a, a person in a million people on the street without an AI system? Uh, you could do like a 3D reconstruction of the of the face. There's some, uh, some research in this area. I mean, it's not any practical system today, but it's, they're quite close, as I understand. So basically, you can make a 3D model from the face by filming it over some time, and then you have a 3D model you can match against other 3D models, and this matching does not need to use uh, AI-based matching. Uh, okay, that would be interesting if that ever comes to, to a large-scale um, uh, possibility. Um, I mean, the... Uh, as I said, when we're trying to be future-proof, so we're trying to have something which can be used in the, in the future, but that doesn't mean that it won't be changed. Um, I I don't know whether, no, I probably didn't mention that, but I mean, we're now in 21, so we've been working on this for three years. AI is still very much at the, at, at the beginning, so there are plenty of other things which will come up in AI. And that means that the AI regulation is also very much at the beginning. So um, right now we've tried to focus on things I mean, we, uh, I know it's it's not actually directly be addressing your concern because it's slightly, slightly different, but we've tried to focus on things which are now on the market. Because I mean, if you, if you, if you follow the, down the road of, uh, you know, AI could do this, that, and the other in the future, and therefore we have re to regulate it, you know, and try to anticipate everything which could happen, could happen in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, then you, we will come to an approach where you have to regulate everything because, um, you know, AI can potentially be applied everywhere. And you would have to regulate everything in ignorance of how it actually de develops. So for the moment, we have tried to focus really on things which are on the market. Uh, so uh, when it comes to face recognition, we have regulated this in the, in the, in the framework of, of AI. Uh, A, because uh, this is a, a horizontal AI regulation. Uh, so we can really regulate out. Otherwise, we would have to define AI in, in, in another way. Uh, and B, uh, it is uh, quite possible that in the future this has, will have to be changed. There, there's a possibility of changing the, the annex of, uh, first of all, of the, of the applications. Uh, and of course, you could also in, 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 in the future uh, change, the, uh, the, change the other annexes. Um, but we're talking, you know, I think for the next couple of years, we will try to stay uh, at least with this uh, regulation. Um, it has been proposed, so even now in early 21, uh, I think realistically, if you get the council and the parliament adopted by, let's say, in, in 20, maybe in 2022, you know, it could go into 23, maybe very late 21, and then you have an implementation phase. So before it actually really starts, we're going to be looking at 2025. 
uh, and then you know in, in ten years time or so there will there will I, I I'm fairly sure that there will be um, there will be uh, you know there will be changes to be made to to that. Um, but you are, you always I mean the, the AI definition so when it comes back coming back to the face recognition itself you know you have to read actually the article uh, the article um, three I think it is so the, the 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 text which I put up on the screen together with the annexes. Um, so um, I would have to look exactly at what kind of tech, I mean you would have to look very carefully to see whether you actually can do that without falling into any of these categories. Okay, I think uh, I don't know, Leonard, if you have another comment on that, or if we can. No, no I mean, I'll check the. You said it's Alex Tree in. Uh... No, wait, say. It's there are two documents. There's one is the regulation itself, and then then, then yes. it's annex, and then there's the the annexes to the regulation. Ah, yes, yeah, so just... they have definition of AI there. Yeah, yeah. The, the definition of AI is in the main text. So that's article. I think it's article three or article one or two is one of the first articles and then in the uh, in the annex yeah uh, and it says you know you, you used among other things uh, using one of the uh, developed using one of uh, one of the technologies in the annex and then in the annex you have a number of technologies yes okay Which, all right yeah, so. we can maybe we can move to Emilia who but, 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 also... sorry 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 but 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 please do send me some some more on that because I would be interested in in in, in knowing more about that I will do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Uh, so my comment relates with uh, biometrics. Biometrics, there are two classes. There are the physiological ones and there are the behavioral ones. The large part of the industry is based on behavioral ones. In the legislation, it is not clear where they are positioned in the risk classes. Behavioral biometrics, they do not use a physical characteristic of the body. They use to profile the individuals based on their behavior. It can be based on wearable devices where you have also characteristic, physical characteristics which are uh, tackled like temperature, activity and so on, tilt. Uh, but then in the legislation, it, in this proposal, it is not clear where they stand. Are they considered biometrics? and uh, be included in a high risk. I will give an example. For example, in the advertising industry, there are IDs for users and they are based on the behavior of uh, people. Of course, uh, this allows, knowing the profile of the individual, this allows also to understand where this individual is positioned. So it doesn't give you specific location, but it gives you all needed information to profile this individual. Where this will stand? In which I'm, class? I didn't I'm, find it in Linux free, so I just had a look. There is the machinery regulation, there are uh, toy safety, there are many different. Um, yes, I see here from law enforcement, high risk. This is the usage by law enforcement, but what about the one used in advertising? This is not uh, specified. It is uh, private companies, for example. I mean, the, I, 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 just tracking a person is not biometrics. So if you, you know, if you, uh, if you are able to identify a person by, uh, you know, on the web because uh, whatever technology is to give him identify the number, that's not biometrics. Biometric has to be something to be able to identify people uh, one way or another was something of their, their natural personal, personality. So uh, I, I would, I mean, I have to look at the exact wording, but the way I understand it, biometrics is, is really, is, is not, uh, it's, it's certainly not the, the tracking of, of, uh, of people. That's, I mean, you can track people with biometrics, that's a problem. And that's why we are very restrictive on the biometrics. Uh, but biometrics does not uh, extend to, I don't know, your shopping habits. That's, that, that isn't biometrics. Okay, so I will look further also in this. I had the other two questions. Thank you, Anika, for giving the floor. I will pass it to Professor Bryson, so I'll try to be as short as possible. Uh, the other two questions regarded uh, on no, first hand the standardization. Um, while looking at uh, the main document, 
uh, there is Article 40 and Article 41. Article 40 mentions harmonized standards, and Article 41 mentions common specification. A big uh, bottleneck for SMEs is should we focus on standardization on this Article 40? Should we concentrate our efforts in standardization? Because then the requirements, if we fall under the high risk, they will come from harmonized standards. Or should we focus on common specification? And the other fold of this question, again on standardization, um, we saw there was only one request for harmonized standards on the 14th of April, if I remember well, on medical devices, which was recently accepted. There was no further request on harmonized uh, standard to send Senelec uh, for AI. Uh, should we expect that will come? Um, yes. So that will be my standardization question. Well, I, I certainly think that it's, it's likely that more and more standardization will take place on AI. Uh, it uh, is certainly something which uh, which uh, which I th which we which we expect. Um, I don't know in how far the AML standards and common specifications are really uh, whether it's really an an alternative to to one another. I mean, sorry, in in, in how far you know you, you should. As you said, you should focus on one or the other. I mean, there are some areas where you, you know, you it, it goes area by area anyway. In some of them, you have harmonized standards, and others you have common specifications. So, um, you know, if, if, please. Yeah. So I don't know if you're just making it up. If you have uh, an area of your technology where there are harmonized standards, then you would want to pay attention to the harmonized standards. If in another area there are only common specifications, um, then you obviously pay attention to the common specifications. So depending on what exactly it is that you do and you develop, then either one, one or the other would be more important. We have currently at the CENSELEC, we have the newly created GTC21 on artificial intelligence. And we are active uh, there on uh, the technical report for conformity assessment. And we would like to know how we should advance further uh, on that, because uh, there are standards industry specific, but for artificial intelligence, this is new and we'd like to prepare our work on that. So, but that uh, I understand that this is information we have so far. So thank you for yes, providing yeah. <laughs> yeah, but for, for, for the, uh, you know, for how would you say mandates and work requirements for Senelec, um, that is uh, something which, the, you know, the appropriate part of the commission will, will I guess, uh, you know, well, not, I guess I'm sure uh, we'll contact you. That's uh, not something I can tell you now. Um, uh, we, I mean, you know, your your counterparts in DG Grow, uh, they will eventually come up to you and tell you and and uh, express their uh, their needs. I think. I, I, sorry, I, I can't tell you right now what their work plan is and what it, you know when they expect to 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 issue which request. Thank you. Maybe I will leave my question to the end to give Professor Bryson also the occasion to put all her questions. I have another one on regulatory sandboxes, but you can wait. Please, Professor Bryson. Um, yes, well, yeah, we have, okay, we have a question on sandboxes, and then we also have a question from Stelian and Aurelie, but indeed, so maybe Professor Bryson, you can go first and keep it maybe to one or two questions, and then we can go back. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I very much appreciate that this is about SMEs, and so I wanted to hear. In fact, one of the reasons I'm here is to hear what the SMEs' concerns are. Uh, so I'll try to keep it super short. I know I'm bad at that, um, but uh, I think uh, I have a lot of concerns about exactly some of the lines that are being drawn. Um, uh, not only about definitions of AI, but also about uh, you know the incredible importance of fundamental rights. It's such a luxury to be in the area. Uh, where, where that's not a big concern, but really right on our borders, we're seeing them violated in ways we didn't anticipate. Um, so, uh, but anyway, I, for this context, I think the biggest issue is uh, this question about what covers everything and why, why draw lines anywhere. Um, so I, I, for proportionality, I love the DSA. I love the fact that, uh, that there was a right there's so there's an underregulated space which is the social media spaces in those spaces and they said you guys go out and assess what your harms possibly are and then you figure out proportional uh defenses and then we certify that you did a good job and that you tried hard and then if there's any harms that you didn't anticipate we'll let you know basically you'll have lower 
uh, costs, you'll still have liabilities, but those liabilities will be lower. And so I guess the most important question, I think, for SMEs and ask also out of all the <laughs> stuff I type, I type too fast, uh, is this this issue of um, will what is the standard product law? Is is all software a product? Can we just recognize it as a manufactured output, and so that we can apply standard uh, product laws and product liabilities across it? Because um, I loved I loved what Vesiger and uh, Thierry said about the fact that uh, that there is still law applying to the low risk. It's just that there's not new law. It's the established law. But can we just have some more clarity about how established law does apply to software, whether or not we call it AI? Well, I mean, we are, at least our proposal only addresses AI. I mean, we're not, uh, it was now never our mandate to regulate all of software. <laughs> As far as I know, the only software which right now is classified as products is in the medical medical uh, in the medical regulation of, of last year. So it's a, the first time that uh, software actually is classified as a product. Um, but but our approach here is really to say um, AI is special, and therefore we have to have special rules for AI. Now, if you think that in general software needs to be regulated, then you would have to make the case to to the policymakers. This is not the mandate we have been given. We've been given only the mandate to to address AI, both from from our commission, from the president, and, and the high level group. Um, I'm sure that there are laws. Sorry. Sorry, but you've heard the consequences of that. I mean, I've been on panels where Google claimed that the high risk AI is only an algorithm, a machine, a new machine learning algorithm that's 18 months old. I mean, that's not what scuppered the uh, Brexit vote, you know. And and the and at the same time, you just heard somebody here try to assert that one algorithm wasn't AI. So I think I agree that that was your remit, but your remit had a big hole in it. And and I hope we have an opportunity to say, okay, like AI is becoming ubiquitous; it's becoming a standard, a software engineering technique. And so therefore, we really do need to think about what are the knock-on consequences. We do not want to create barriers for people to be you know arguing and negotiating and bribing and whatever else to try to say oh don't don't apply your liabilities to me so that that i i appreciate that, that was the job you were given but but um i i'm one of many experts that tried to say be careful about this job and try to think and, and i liked the way that it's termed and and like i said the definition you came up with is nice and broad but please don't be persuaded that like just oh because we you know we 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 use a, a some an algorithm that was described in a book from 1950 it can't possibly be AI, right or something like that. No, I, I don't think that's you know even if an algorithm exists since uh, Pythagoras it can still be AI according to our definition. Um, no, I I appreciate that there are other debates out there. Um, and uh, you know, if you want, if you could start a, a long debate about you know how much to regulate software uh, altogether. Um, which I don't think we we can do right now, but you know it's it's might, might be an interesting debate at another time. I think the the more interesting question here is, um, you know, whether uh, over time, and I, I think to a certain extent it, it, the danger is going more in the other direction, because over time AI will develop into you know will come into more and more other applications, and therefore more and more other applications will fall uh, potentially under under the AI regulation. So uh, in you know I. Um, how do I say that? I'm sure there are there are there's software out there which can have nasty effect. Um, and yes, there, there are some people out there who well, I mean, there's, there, there can be debate about whether that should be regulated another time. Um, but uh, well, maybe but what we, we should be doing yeah. is defining AI as being the kinds of things that have the effects that you've described, and then not care about if it's done with mechanics or by you know human human uh, uh, you know, Amazon Turk kind of style or or what the technology is, but maybe artificial intelligence is something that transforms a context into an output. And that's the definitions I use. That's the definitions of intelligence going back to the 19th century. So, so maybe we should be looking at exactly when you, all, these, all this work you've done about like, these are the kinds of outcomes we want to avoid, then yeah, let's maybe AI is stuff that could possibly produce that outcome and who cares about the, the means by which it was achieved. Well, I mean, yeah, as I say, I mean, you can have a, a that would not i mean yeah you could still call it AI, but of course it wouldn't be really really an ai uh regulation in the sense we're talking about it would be kind of a general software regulation as as you're advocating um, well, and it, and it, it, the definition it, is currently in article three 
No, but you said that if we, that we don't care what the body appendix, definition. The appendix part, yeah, but the but it, it fits pretty well into what you said. Okay, I'll I'll drop it. Yeah. No, sorry, but I, I, I understand it's it's a good point, but uh, you know, I'm I'm afraid. That, well, it's not, I don't know whether it's a good point or not. That's the question. It's an interesting debate, uh, but uh, I'm afraid we we you know we won't be able to solve it within in the framework of our AI regulation here. I think well, I think it's an interesting dis discussion, and um, I'm sure some of the other members here could be interested in that. Also, Leonard, as he did raise this one. Um, one one uh, example where you know you have this line between AI and 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 doing the same thing, but then it would not be AI perhaps. So um, yeah, maybe we can follow up on that uh, separately. But I would still like to give the opportunity to Professor Stelian Brad to ask a question, and then I will leave. And then I saw there were some more questions. So um, yeah, still. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I really appreciate Anika, the initiative of uh, European Digital SME Alliance to have this uh, this interaction, this event with um, people which are very close to uh, the um, this initiative of the European Commission, and I think it's very much welcome because I just like to see from another angle uh, this uh, perspective in a positive way because um, yeah, we. We have now the opportunity uh, around uh, such an initiative to ask questions, to raise up uh, some concerns, and this is, I think, the most valuable asset or uh, outcome of this initiative. Nevertheless, yeah, we might find uh, from a technological point of view some, uh, let's say, challenges that uh, sure in uh, in a framework of uh, Having a, a feedback loop uh, from uh, the bottom to the level of policymakers, we can improve uh, in Europe uh, these initiatives. But uh, from the perspective of SMEs, I would say uh, this act uh, uh, comes up with a lot of clarifications uh, because, um, uh, and I'm talking here especially, especially of the users of um, such uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, the advantage of, uh, let's say, the, the, the concept of the act is that it is mainly focused on the fields of application, highlighting the, the risks and uh, especially some very sensitive areas where we have to avoid uh, and discourage developing technologies and applying such technologies. Uh, it is very courageous, in my opinion, the fact that um, European Commission um, highlighted uh, the, let's say, um, uh, situations such as those mentioned in China or in Russia, uh, where uh, AI is not using for the benefit of citizens, but uh, by contrary to uh, generate a, a lot of pressure, daily pressure uh, of citizens. And by this act, uh, we have to not be afraid that in Europe uh, democracy will be affected by. Uh, the technology. Of course, uh, um, I will also see uh, a, a huge opportunity through uh, this initiative of bottom-up uh, to come up with uh, some uh, details and clarification at the industry levels because uh, in, including uh, European Digital uh, SME Alliance as uh, let's say a catalyst of uh, uh, digital SMEs in Europe uh, to be um, a messenger as a, and a bridge to uh, European Commission in order to clarify the application in different industries. And this is very encouraging from my perspective. I have an issue also to these positive comments uh, related with um, the intersection of this act with, uh, let's say, uh, politely put as a dual use or also defense or military use. How? we should uh, consider AI technology in relation with uh, uh, these situations. Thank you. Well, I mean, the military use is excluded, so we're not, we're not covering military excuse, and dual use is, uh, is uh, well, for the, for the civil part, they're included, and the dual, dual, <laughs> the dual use regulation uh, continues, of course, to apply. But fundamentally, we're not dealing here with uh, military applications. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we had a similar question from Aurelie before, whether yeah, military usage of AI is included. Okay, so we have answered that. 
Um, but Aurelie, but, you also had yeah. another question, right? Yeah. No, I, I wanted to ask, uh, yeah, I was um, writing down this, this question of the military use of AI, but uh, then now that you have confirmed that it's not dealing with uh, the uh, this kind of usage, which would be uh, the integration of AI in weapons, why is this the case that the Act is not regulating uh, this particularly? It's Basically because, because we, there will be another regulation afterwards that will to do that. Or? Basically, because we don't have the competence to do that. I mean, we are regulating the single market, and uh, military applications are not part of, of the of the single market regulations. Uh, on, on, and also, I mean, apart from that, on a practical <coughs> level, I mean, how would you regulate? How would you like regulate safeguarding fundamental rights if you're building machines which specifically are made to violate them? You know, if you if you want if you wanted to if you're building weapons, you're actually specifically doing mach pr producing machines trying to violate human rights by killing or maiming people. So I can I, I find it difficult to imagine how you would want to uphold human rights while violating human rights at the same time. So I, I, I the, the entire approach is seems to be uh, a bit strange. Uh, but in any case, we don't have the competence. Uh, this is not part of our competence. It's uh, we're, we're for for defense issues, we're not uh, EU. Uh, there are some various things the EU can do for uh, in um, in the defense issues, but uh, they're, they're very limited and they have a completely different procedures and a much stronger role for the for the for the member states. And it's not for okay. the Commission to to do that. So this this would be regulated at state uh, at member state level. So Mostly at member state level. That, that, as I said, I mean, I I'm not a specialist because the common foreign security policy is, is really a special domain where you have special procedures there. So there could be some kind of cooperation and some kind of things uh, done at the at the at the European level. Uh, but overwhelmingly, it's not for the you know we the European Commission certainly doesn't and the and the regular um, I mean the standard decision making uh, process doesn't apply there. Okay, and then I have uh, more practical question which was um, I had the impression that um, the C mark or that there would be something like a C mark for AI system so that will be linked to uh, standards but uh, it is for me very clear I am involved in, in different so standardization activities and they are really at the beginning so what would how will C marking work in this tra uh, transient period where there are no standards that can be used by the industry? Well, I mean, you can, of course, use the CMR also without the, the standards, but uh, normally by the time the application, the, the, the regulation actually applies, uh, there should be standards uh, in place. If you look at the end, uh, I think the last article, let me just get this on my screen. Uh, it gives you the actual entry into force and there is a second. Ah, okay, what does it say here? So it will. So the regulation, this Article 85, shall into 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 force on the 20th day after the publication, and then it says the regulation shall apply from two years after the entering into the force. So on the day the regulation will uh, is adopted. So let's assume it's going to be adopted in, let's say, end of 2022. Uh, it then still does not apply for two years, um, and then you have some 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 parts which apply a little bit earlier. Uh, so, if you do the calculation, so let's say it's adopted by the end of 22, two years. So we're talking about end of 22, 24. So we've got three and a half years to develop standards. Okay. I think that's a good answer and I think it still means that as um, digital SME and as members of this group we can we can already think about you know how how standards could then also be like because we have a couple of people in that are sitting in in um, some technical committees so I think it's worth to think about how we can make sure that the standards are not are going to be suitable for SMEs because that's always a, an issue as well to have enough SME representation in the committees. Um, there are more, yeah, more questions, but I would quickly like to ask everyone to take a group picture because um, 
usually towards the end of the session, uh, people are logging off a bit earlier, so it would be nice to have a group picture that we can um, put on Twitter or uh, yeah, just use for social media. So if you could turn on your camera, we will take a screenshot. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, let's uh, go back a little bit more to our discussion because there were still a couple of questions. Um, we had one definitely or even two on sandboxes. So Ruth wanted to hear more about regulatory sandboxes for SMEs, but also Emilia. So maybe um, Ruth, if you want to go first, and then Emilia, because you already spoke. Thank you, Annika. Um, yes, it was just uh, in relation to the use of regulatory sandboxes for SMEs, the idea of promoting um, AI innovation through these. And then one of the biggest components, as I could see it, would be to keep the compliance costs for SMEs reduced or at a minimum as well. So it was just, I was looking at some of the um, the costs relating to the different levels of AI, uh, some of them seem quite high for your average SME user or innovator. And it was just to discuss this a little bit more. Well, I mean, I think the the key point here of the of the sandboxes is really uh, it's a bit like uh, you know you have in the financial services sector you uh, you have sandboxes as well. Um, there are various kinds of sandboxes. One is the kind of sandbox where you suspend certain regulatory requirements and therefore allow people to basically not respect certain regulations. That's not what we, we what we're talking about here. Uh, <clears throat> the idea of the regulatory sandbox is here. I mean, from from what we hear from the companies, and you can maybe confirm that is that one of the big problems is really that people don't know uh, how uh, what the legislation actually implies. I mean, certainly with the GDPR, there was a big problem. So people read the regulation, but they didn't actually know. Okay, if I do this, that, or the other. Uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, do I do I fulfill the obligations? Do I not fulfill the obligations? Uh, and therefore, getting some kind of authoritative advice of whether something is possible or not uh, apparently is something which is really much very much in demand. And that's what the sandboxes are there for. So that uh, the, you know, if you are participating in one of the sandboxes, you get access to to basically official interpretation of what you can and cannot do. Uh, which then gives you the possibility to experiment uh, without uh, having a lawyer, you know, which, without having to pay a lawyer at every turn of the uh, of of, uh, of of your of the step to see whether you're still within the law or not. Uh, and of course, the idea is that the SMEs would get priority access because large companies. I mean, even so far as they actually want to take advantage of it, uh, which they probably will not do very much because it's, you know, they have their own department. Um, but they certainly can can uh, afford uh, lawyers much better than, than smaller companies, and therefore the idea is that SMEs get uh, priority access, so they uh, are the first. If in so far as there's a capacity constraint, they are the first to uh, to be able to get this advice. Okay, I think there was another question on the sandboxes from Emilia, which was also more practical. If I... Yes, thank you. I think it's uh, clearly related with what Ruth said. Uh, while looking at the costs, uh, there is an estimation of the cost, and we see there are 6,000, 7,000 if we take, uh, uh, take it now and we try to prepare ourselves, but it can raise up to 170,000 euros which is a lot for an SME in 2025. So leaving this as an SME, we want to be as fast as possible in getting um, involved with uh, the regulatory sandboxes and in supporting the upbringing of these sandboxes. I understand there is a priority access. Would you advise a strategy for SMEs to get um, involved in uh, this testing with the regulatory sandboxes as soon as possible in order to reduce costs? This is something that maybe it's a message which is important for SMEs. So this uh, would be my first question. And the second question relating to regulatory sandboxes. As SMEs, uh, of course, in order to reduce this compliance costs, which are, can be important, we can also contribute. We are AI SMEs. Some of us, we develop also this kind of testing and we are willing to uh, volunteer, uh, providing the tests that we are able to do 
in order to support regulatory sandboxes and maybe there, but this might be a more detailed question, what happens with our IP? Uh, so if we don't have a patent, uh, how can we get protected? But this is a punctual question on which I'm not actually expecting a clear answer because it might be too detailed. Yeah, so but, well, first of all, I mean, the 170,000 is not a uh, compliance cost. The 170,000, which is mentioned in the impact assessment, is the, what the, the, the estimate which has been used for the average cost of development of an AI system. Okay. So, That's you, yes. yeah, so we assume that the company spends 170,000 on developing a system, and if, you, and if you take that kind of system, then you get to compliance cost of five to six thousand. So, you would, you know, then we have to add these five or six thousand <clears throat> if you actually do all of this more or less from scratch. As I said, much of that will be done anyway, but so if you, in the worst case, you have to like, calculate five to six thousand as cost of the regulation. 170,000 is not the cost of regulation. Um, the sandboxes, I mean, we, we do have the sandboxes. We also have the testing and the experimentation facilities, uh, which maybe is less important for standalone software, more, more for the product, uh, but it's, it's certainly something which, which is also um, uh, I think uh, can be of great value for, uh, for, to SMEs. So as soon, I mean, you know, how would I say that? Um, insofar as you have use for it, please go, please, I mean, and first of all, the, these, the sandboxes are developed by the national authorities. So by, by the member states. So it depends a bit on whether in, in your member state they actually do already exist or whether it's being developed. Uh, but if insofar as there's one and if you can use it, then, you know, by all means, please do use it. It's, um, that's what they're there for. Um, you have to be, you know, in some, it, it depends obviously on this, also on the sector you're working on. If you're, if you're in the, I don't know, in the wash machine business and, uh, and the sandbox is only for face recognition, then that's not going to help you very much. So, you know, obviously you have to kind of see whether the, the, the offers are there, which, which are, which are there for you. But it, if, if it, if it fits your business request and, and, and what you need, then by all means, please. Uh, do use them as 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 much as possible. Uh, on IP, I don't think this is going to affect your IP in any particular way. I mean, you wouldn't typically, you know, give your your software away or whatever. I mean, a, a sandbox uh, basically, as I said, means they would kind of give you advice of what you can or cannot do. It doesn't, uh, you know, they might actually in that way get an idea of your business idea, but your intellectual property, I don't think that that would be. I mean, I, I would have to look, the, you know, we would have to check that more in detail, but I think fun, fundamentally it shouldn't be a problem with, with IP in that respect. Uh, what I take also from you, I think it's an interesting uh, development, is the, uh, if the sandboxes they are developed by the national member states, maybe for the SMEs would be useful to have such a list. Uh, what are the uh, different developments that we keep such a list? This is more for Annika, <laughs> that you, if we could keep like a document where we keep a list of all these uh, developments in the member states that the SMEs could have access, but this is more for Anika than... <laughs> no, that's, yes. I, I, that's actually a good idea. I, I'll, I'll take note of that. Thank you for that and for all the feedback. Yes, indeed, Emilia, I was also thinking the same, that it will also be difficult for us <laughs> actually to, to uh, really know, but, um, but yeah, so... I don't know, there would be co some coordination, of course. Um, and if, if Ms. Dolbridge is taking note of that as well, it's, it's a good point. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I just want to give everyone still the opportunity to, to raise a question if there is still another one. So um, either just put your name in the chat or just uh, yeah, turn on your camera and unmute yourself then um, we can address your question. And if there are no further questions, I would just like to, yeah, to share a quick uh, overview of the next steps, and then um, we can close the meeting. So as Ms. Ulrich was saying, we have, um, um, yeah, so the, the consultation is, is now open. So the European Commission is collecting feedback on the proposed legislation. Indeed, as you were saying, they are not really um, so much in the game anymore, but it's the Parliament and the Council. So we, um, this, this is what's going to happen afterwards. They're going to debate it and vote on it. And, um, but however, we still have the opportunity to provide comments on this uh, draft 
proposal, draft legislation, and the consultation will close on 14th of July. Um, and we're going to send, so we would, um, if there is enough feedback coming from, from your side and the other members, uh, we would draft a joint response on behalf of Digital SME. So I'm going to follow up also um, per email and send you yeah, a consultation document. And, um, and then we can develop a joint response to, and the idea would be to, to get your feedback by mid-June so we have enough time to reply to the, um, to the consultation from the Commission by uh, 14th of July. So yeah, that's, um, that's that. And then as mentioned, we are thinking to launch a task force specifically on AI and standards, also on ethics and AI. So here, um, that's going to be there's going to be a call for that in um, like around the time when we're organizing the next workshop in June. So keep an eye out for that, and we're really happy for your interest, um, especially as we have many people who are also active in standardization. So it would be good to bring SMEs together here and to make sure that uh, we are ready for these next steps. Um, as as it was explained. There's still a bit of room then until um, this proposal would come into force, and um, but the standards, of course, by then would would probably be needed. So, so yeah, so it's good to get get active now. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everyone, and uh, of course, especially Mr. Ulbrich for his time and his um, yeah his expertise and answering all these questions. But also thank you for everyone to your for your really, really interesting questions and for your, um, yeah, for being present here today. And uh, looking forward to continuing our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.